Thank you very much. I, I think I just want to follow on for a minute here by what um, Professor Hewitt said about the connection between Harry Messel and radio telemetry, and particularly because I'm using crocodiles as examples in my talk, and of course both of these things, telemetry and crocodile research, were pioneered by Harry Messel. Um, in the 1960s, I believe, Professor Messel came to Australia to test radio transmitters on crocodiles, just to test them in very harsh environments, and what he found was that there weren't any crocodiles left. And that really started a lot of wildlife conservation on crocodiles, not only in Australia, but it extended internationally. And Professor Messel also was the um, president of the president? Chair. chairman of the uh, Crocodile Specialist Group, which is an IUCN organization that now oversees the conservation of crocodiles. So I'm very pleased to be speaking on radio telemetry and a bit about crocodiles in front of Harry Messel. So thank you, Harry, on, on my behalf and on behalf of the science, uh, scientific community in general. So what I'll talk about today is I'll give you a very broad introduction, which deals with interactions. All living systems interact with one another and with the environment. And we read in the newspapers every day these days that environments change, humans change environments, and it's exactly that that A, drives all evolution the natural systems we see today are the results of interactions with the environment. And human impact is just one factor that changes the environment. So I'll give you a broad int introduction to that. And then make clear the need to understand not only the environment, but also interactions between living organisms and the environment. And that's, of course, essential in preserving the Earth and preserving the human species and our lifestyle. And how does telemetry fit in this? Telemetry consists of radio transmitters that give a signal that is received remotely. It provides the link between what happens in nature and what we can understand as humans. So we can study wildlife and undisturbed circumstances using telemetry. And then I've, um, I um, finish up giving you three examples I was involved in in the last few years. And it, each of these examples deals with one particular aspect of telemetry. One is um, looking at an invasive species. I'll make the point that invasive species are nothing but an alteration of the environment that is human-induced. So, as humans, we need to manage the environment. We have to understand the impact of what we do to a natural environment. I'll talk a bit about physiology, and, and I use crocodiles as an example. Physiology, of course, tells or it represents the capacity of animals to live in their environment, the capacity, the hardware, if you like, how they can respond to the environment and how, what they can tolerate or not tolerate. And the third one deals with more behavioural on a broader scale as satellite tracking of crocodiles, which is a specific um, management application, which probably comes best down, um, back to Harry's work back in the 1960s, which is tracking crocodiles to understand what these animals do. Okay, the environment. Now, there's probably two principal parts to it. One is abiotic, which is, of course, temperature, humidity, solar radiation, um, the physics of the environment. And in response to changes to that, there's the organismal environment. Now, as organisms, and we know that, as we get dressed in the mornings, we, just, we, we think about how cold is it going to be, I put a jumper on. We interact with the environment all the time. So as an organism, we're not independent from the environment. The environment will have an effect on us in a specific way, but we will have an effect on other organisms as well. So in my example is prey. In, in our case, if we want to continue the human example, it could be... Um, animals for food. It could be our um, simple pets. It could be um, urban wildlife. So as an organism, we influence other organisms. And thus, but we are also influenced by a third group of organisms. The point I'm getting at is that there's a complex interaction between organisms, but also the environment will affect each of these organisms differentially. So what you have is a situation of 
a second order differential, if you like. Organisms interact, in, uh, interact with one another, and each of those is in, in affected by the environment in a different way. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that when we think about the environment, and when we think about the impact of humans on the environment, it's dynamic. Nothing nature is stable, and the dynamics are so complex that if we change any aspect of the abiotic environment, it's almost impossible to foretell what's going to happen as a result. Because to understand those interactions is almost impossibly um, complicated. But one way we can try to understand it is have a look and, and manipulate the environment, have a look at the natural environment and manipulate it. And one way to do that is by telemetry. If we have environmental change, either induced natural environmental change or human-induced environmental change, we have different temporal scales. Now, you know yourself, your environment changes. As you walk out of this lecture, lecture theatre, you will change your environment. You will come from a warm room into a cold room. So there's an acute change in your environment. And we have to respond to that all the time. Any organism will respond to that at any time. And then there's greater temporal scales of change. There's daily changes, day and night, sunshine and darkness. There are seasonal changes. And then what I put down as geological changes over millions of years. But there's also cycles. If you look at climate, over a tens and hundreds and thousands of years. So what you have is superimposed on one, one of, on the other is longer term changes and on top of that are shorter term changes. So you have, if you like, a Fourier series of all these different periodicities superimposed on one another. And that really makes the environment. And I think the point is clear. We're not dealing with something that's stable. And what we're looking at if you look at any sort of natural environment, we're looking at a response over evolutionary time to change. The responses, of course, can happen, as if you look at an individual organism, can happen at a number of levels. Behaviour. I've made a couple of examples to bring it back to us. Our behaviour changes depending on our environment. Seasonal changes, for example, bring about different behaviours. We change our insulation in our clothing. Um, our behaviour, we seek heat, we avoid heat every day. If we stand in the sun on a cold day, we go in the shade on, the, on a warm day. So behaviour is extremely important, but not, also, all, and not only in a direct sense to the um, biotic, abiotic environment, also towards the abiotic environment. Interaction between organisms. With organisms that is, of course, animals, plants, um, and microorganisms, and interaction between those makes up the whole ecological network that maintains the whole system. Go back to what I said before, you take any of the, um, an aspect of that ecological network out, you change the whole interactions. Suddenly your differential equations, if you like, are all changed, because the interactions will change. And that's really the danger of modifying environments, but it's also the crux to understanding it. Because change, as I said, is the crux to drive evolution. It's the, it's the very stimulus, if you like. And then lastly, physiology. That, um, as I said before, it determines the capacity of animals. What can animals tolerate? For example, you know, as humans, if you have a fever and, and your body temperature rises above 42 or so degrees, 41 degrees, you're close to death. You're at the end of your capacity. Your body, your physiology cannot handle that increased temperature. Other animals can. So there, each individual or each organism and species has different ranges of capacities. And that's why it's important to have a look at physiology of animals, to know what to expect from that animal or what to know what that animal is capable of. Now let me talk about temperature a little bit more because temperature really... Temperature is a curious parameter, it's so easily measured, and its, it's importance, importance is so ubiquitous. Anything that happens in your bodies, in any org organism's body, body, is dependent on temperature. Now look at yourself simply as a bag of animated chemicals. That's all you are. It's thousands upon thousands of biochemical reactions. They're all tied in with each other. They ha all have to occur at certain rates, at certain times, in certain parts of your bodies. You know, for example, some diseases come about 
if you lack certain enzymes, that means there's an imbalance in your body. And at the same time, temperature will affect the rates of all those biochemical reactions. That's why you will die if your body temperature will rise above 42 degrees, because the temperature effect on a lot of your biochemical reactions will be negative. It will cause the reactions to decline, and therefore your system breaks down. So temperature is probably one of the most important biochemical and environmental variables. Of course, temperature is also, when we look at climate change and climate, it's the variable we look at. Now, the reason, the reason why, for example, fevers are, are so important or so detrimental is because proteins denature. Fever has evolved to denature proteins of pathogens, for example. But, of course, if that, if that fever or the temperature is too great, your proteome proteins will break down. And in the same way, all organisms will respond to environmental temperatures. Now, don't forget... Mammals like us and birds are probably the only animals that are endothermic, that produce their own metabolic heat, and we try to regulate our internal temperature. But 99% of all animals, or all organisms on Earth, are what's called ectothermic. Their internal temperature will depend on environmental temperature and behavior. That, of course, means that environmental temperature will also impact the internal workings, the whole biochemistry, to a much greater extent than in an endotherm like mammals and birds. But don't forget, we are the exception, the others are the rule. So all physiological rate functions are temperature dependent. Now, use temperature as a particular example because you read so much about it with global warming and so on and so forth, and because it is so important, important in biological functions. But it, it provides a great example of how changes in an abiotic parameter, temperature, will affect biotic life. And I'll come back to temperature um, when I talk to, um, about one of my examples. Now, let's have another quick look at this. And the point I want to bring across here is that the, simply how differently animals react, how different animals or organisms will respond. If you have a look at um, the top right-hand figure here, have body temperature on the x-axis, and there's a rate function. That rate function could be an enzyme catalyzed by a chemical reaction. It could be the rate of muscle contraction. It could be the heart, your heart rate or cardiovascular function. And what happens is there's an optimal temperature range at which all of these things happen at a rate that fits together that make the organism work optimally. And the top figure could probably be um, fairly much representative of mammals or humans, where there's a very narrow peak. But if you look at the bottom here, the same axes, most animals or most organisms have a much broader peak in response to environmental temperature change. It doesn't make any sense. As humans, we're very tied to, even intellectually, to this optimal range. But if you think we like to believe in stability, I think a lot of people get a little bit unnerved when, when things change because we are used to, at least biologically, but I think it's almost socially as well, um, we're used to stability. We, we believe in narrow optimal ranges. But if you think of it, and I'll give you examples in a moment, that the environment changes constantly, always has changed. It's not stability, but change that drives evolution, and we see, um, or, or has resulted in the environment we see now. So it makes a lot more sense, if you like, to be tolerant of variation in the environment. But whether or not particular organisms are tolerant or are very specialized, that's for us to find out. That's exactly what we need to know if we want to manage the environment. And that's exactly why we need to go and find out what organisms do in their natural environment. We have to find out their behavior and their physiology to be able to predict what changes, either natural or human-induced changes, what effect those changes will have on particular organisms. Now, let's have a look at climate. I said I'd give you an example. And, and I said it was not stability, but change that really drives evolution. That's the norm. The status quo is change, if you like, that 
of course, it's a contradiction. But um, if you look at the climate over the last 600 million years, um, what you have here, this is modern day here, it's the line zero, and then you go back in time. So around the Devonian, you have a lot of um, the ascendancy of fishes, for example. The first terrestrial tetrapods came around in the Carboniferous and Permian. Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous was the age of the dinosaurs. And um, there was a huge mass extinction at the boundary between the Cretaceous and the tertiary. And then in modern time, it's the, what's often called the rise of, rise of the mammals. Now, what I'd like you to take away from this picture is the variability. The huge variability. This is some average global temperatures. So it's a grand average of global temperatures. And there's a variability of 12 degrees. Now, we talk about the impact of human-induced climate change these days and the prognosis of the effect of a 2 or 3 degree mean temperature change are very dire. Now, you have a look at history, at geological history, and what you see is that the variability that naturally occurred at a geological time scale was huge. So what we see today, what we see all... Um, Animal life we see today, I concentrate on animals, this is of course true for plants as well, um, is a result of evolution against this backdrop of climate. Now if you want to zoom in a little bit on um, like the last 20,000 years, what you see, even at a much shorter time scale, what you see is a, is a very big variation in climate. Have a look at this. This is modern day here. So everything is um, expressed as a change from modern day averages. This is interesting, this little blip here is interesting. It's the little ice age around 1300, 1400 AD that caused, for example, Viking settlements in Greenland to disappear. It caused famine in Europe because the climate became colder. So in written history, we have this event of a climate change. If you look at, for example, about 2000 years ago, if you look at some old Roman settlements in the Mediterranean, there were um, harbour cities. I'm thinking of places like Ephesus and those big old Roman cities. They're built on a harbour. If you look at it now, they're about a kilometre away from the sea. That's because, of course, back then, um, climate was much warmer, so the sea le levels were much higher. Now, what I'm trying to say is that even within human history, there is a, there is a lot of occurrence of climate change. What I'm not saying is I'm not belittling the effect of climate change. The effect... It's pretty massive. But what I'm saying is natural systems are dynamic. Natural systems have evolved to deal with climate change. And the point of these figures is to show you that climate change happens at different timescales and all the time. And that's what we need to understand. How do natural systems um, respond to change? Climate change is a great example, but there's, of course, other changes. And just to make the point a little bit stronger that Human-induced climate change is not to be neglected. If you have a look at these figures, they're from the UN figures. If you have a look at the red line here, that's actually the observed temperature over the last 150 years. And look at this grey line here. That's the model, that's a climate model that predicts climate change from natural causes alone. So it can explain a lot of the climate change up to the 1970s. So if you then run this same, same model and just model the um, predicted impact of human activity on climate, you can see it doesn't predict this so well, but it predicts this increase very well from the 1970s onwards. So put these two together and you have very powerful modeling, climate modeling, that explains these patterns. And what we see, of course, very dramatically here is this almost linear increase in, in um, again, average temperatures relative to, I think, relative to 1960, to the long-term average. And you see this um, dramatic increase, which, of course, akin to what I said before, will have a major effect on the interaction between organisms. If you think back to the slide I showed you with the arrows going down to organisms and, and prey and predator, so each part of that ecological network will be affected differentially by that climate change. And the challenge now lies in understanding how. We need to manage. What we do, we don't, as, as humans, we don't only change climate, we also change the environment. 
And what we need to do, we need not forget that we are part of the environment as well, of course. We can't see ourselves um, outside the environment, so the need to manage the environment is, is probably one of the greatest needs um, that humans face, I think, in the 21st century. It's not only climate. We do things like have monocultures. We change the environment in such a dramatic way that we totally destroy that interaction. What will be the effect of that interaction, of, of that um, change that we induce all the time? There's a dependence on the environment of, of human, of the success of the human species or, more importantly, to maintain our lifestyle. We have to have a healthy environment. So we should not forget that. And we have to acknowledge and find out the interaction between biotic and abiotic factors in the environment. And then to be able to predict what modifications, the effect of modifications, they are potentially very far-reaching, but I think we have it. We have it in our grasp to actually manage that whole process very well. So let's come to wildlife. Now, wildlife is fairly resilient, really. Wildlife, as I said before, humans are really, or a lot of mammals, are exceptional in that we're very specialized. We're not very resilient but a lot of other animals are. There's a much broader um, tolerance range, if you like, and, and the picture I found the frog actually in the wild, and he's of course got a leg missing, but his resilience was great because he could hop just as well as a two-legged frog, so that we actually stood there, we tried to catch him, and it was very hard, and we stood there and thought, why would frogs bother having two legs? They do very well with one. It just shows you how resilient wildlife can be. But of course there is, a, there is a limit to it, and that limit we have to understand. So the effect of modification is potentially biogeography extinctions. Biogeography, it can just be urban sprawl. It can be big cities. We modify the environment around it. It can be clearing, land clearing. It can be putting in monocultures. We affect the environment. If we don't know what the effect of that will be on the whole in ecological interaction, um, or we have to find out what that is, if we don't know what it may lead to, it's, it's extinctions of species, which then, of course, is the down, sort of a spiral downhill for the whole environment. So what we need to maintain is not only species, individual species, but also communities, because species are not seen in isolation. We have to maintain communities and we have to understand, in, in order to do that, we have to understand the functioning of species and the communities. That's the ecology, the physiology as the capacity, and the behavior, if you like, as an acute response to an environmental change. Now, how to study wildlife? Yes, I tried to take a photo of these two rhinos, and all I could get was their bums, because they're not very cooperative. Animals get easily disturbed. So if you want to go out and study wildlife, it's very difficult. It's possible to catch animals, but once animals are caught, they're not going to do what they naturally do. So there needs to be a, a technique that allows us to learn something about wildlife without disturbing the wildlife. And that's, of course, tricky, but that's where telemetry comes in. So we need to understand the functioning of wildlife in the natural environment. The mechanisms that they use behaviorally, physiologically, and the interactions between animals themselves in the biotic environment, animals um, with other animals and plants, as well as with the physical environment. Disturbers, of course, changes behavior. Now just think behavior and physiology. Think you go to the dentist, for example. You sit in the dentist's chair and someone comes along, measures your heart rate and your blood pressure. I don't think that will be representative of your normal state. It will give a totally wrong um, conclusion because what happens, you, call, you catch animals, you have a huge stress response. Now, there's of course a lot of room for laboratory studies on captive animals, but in order to understand how animals fit in the environment, it's mandatory to go out and find out what they do undisturbed. And that's where radio telemetry comes in. How does it work? Now, radio telemetry is essentially, it works like a radio station and your radio at home. 
you have a transmitter which, which emits a signal that can be received at a distance away. <clears throat> and the simplest the transmitter will beep. It emits beeps and 100, 100 meters a kilometer away you can receive that beep. So what you can do, you can deploy a transmitter onto an animal and receive the signal and that transmitter will tell you something about the animal. It'll tell you at the simplest level where the animal is. But then there's some quite sophisticated technology that'll tell you a number of things about the physiology of the animal as well. And I'll come back to that. The crux here is that you can learn something about the animals while they're out there doing their own thing without being disturbed. Of course, you have to catch the animal once to put the transmitter on. But after that, you can, you can then um, study the animals without any disturbance. I'll give you an example. Now, this is a fairly typical sort of billabong in North Queensland on Cape York, York actually. I'll show you a map in a moment. Now, let's imagine there is a crocodile in this billabong. Now, let's imagine you wanted to find out what that crocodile does all day in the billabong. Now, you wouldn't want to get too close to it. So, if you manage to catch the animal and put a radio transmitter on its back, and then that radio transmitter will send a signal up to several kilometres away. There'll be an antenna that receives it, and then you have a um, receiver. So that way, if you wanted to know where the crocodile goes all day, you wouldn't have to go too close. You could do it from a distance away and simply track it. And that's the, the simplest application of radio telemetry. It's simply, if you manage to get that transmitter onto that crocodile, you can learn a lot about the animal without ever disturbing it again. And that's really the idea behind it. So what sort of measurements can we get then from telemetry? As I said, the simplest is tracking. But if you think of it, if you want to know what animals do in a natural environment, you first of all have to know how do they behave, what sort of microhabitats do they use, where do they sleep at night, where do they shelter, how far do they range during the day. You need to know all those very, very simple parameters in order to understand how that animal fits in to its abiotic and biotic environment. So even in its simplest application, radio telemetry gives you very, very useful data, particularly for management. You have transmitters, for example, that only emit signals when they're actually moving. So you have a switch in that it takes movement. So you then can um, study things like daily activity patterns. You get a signal when the animal's moving, so you know the times of day, for example, uh, example the animals are moving. You can know, for example, in hibernating mammals, when those animals go into hibernation because they don't move. So that's really an extension of simply tracking. A little bit more sophisticated, you can measure um, the state, physiological states of the animal. And one of the mo um, most common applications is temperature telemetry. And you simply have a transmitter, and the, the, freak, or the rate of the signal depends on the temperature of the transmitter. And that gives you an idea, if you put that transmitter inside the animal, it gives you an idea of the temperature of the animal at the time. You can measure a number of cardiovascular parameters. Each heartbeat in, um, generates a voltage, and you can pick that up with the transmitter so that the transmitter beeps every time the heart beats. So you can start from the very simple, simply tracking, to some quite sophisticated applications to learn something about the physiological state of the animal in their natural environment. And I'll give you examples of all of these in the examples I go through. A second um, area probably associated, it's not strictly speaking telemetry, it's called archival telemetry, it's an archive. So what you do, you deploy a device called a data logger often that contains a sensor but also information storage capacity. So it's like a little computer, has a little uh, computer memory in it. And again, the most, um, most common application is temperature. A temperature sensor with a memory um, included. So the, 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 um, the data logger, as it's called, records its own data. Now, the downside of this, of course, is you have to retrieve the unit. With um, radio transmitters, you can get information from the animals without, strictly speaking, having to get the transmitter back. But with these data loggers, 
you have to get them back. And the, and the important thing of not having to give, um, get transmitters back is that you can let them fall off, for example, so you don't have to recapture the animal. Or if you implant them in the body cavity, and I'll give you an example, you can simply leave them in there. So it's a much easier way. Just a couple of examples of temperature loggers. This is the model that came out. Now this is a, just a standard Australian 20 cent coin. And this little thing looks like a camera battery. It's a um, temperature data logger. And um, it, it has enough memory to store, if it records the temperature every five minutes, it has enough memory to store those data um, collected over four weeks. So even though it's very small, it has a great capacity. Now they were not invented for um, wildlife tracking or anything like that. They were invented for the food industry. So you monitor shipments of food and they can down download the data to see if the food heated up beyond health standard levels. But they're great to use to put into animals to learn about their body temperature. The other thing is they're very cheap and they're, they're very hardy. They're just a stainless steel case. They're only about $20. So you can put a lot of these out into animals. Another application is what's called a time depth recorder, for example, which is a little computer that has its own memory in here and it contains a pressure sensor. So you can put this on animals and on aquatic animals and the pressure sensor will give you a measurement of the diving depth of animals. So if you're looking at aquatic animals such as marine turtles or again crocodiles, what you can get is a very good idea of their daily behavior, how they dive and how they come to the surface. And you can then link that to other, other measurements you have, for example, temperature. So you can build one upon the other and using this sort of technology. So that brings me to my first example. And my first example is a, um, it's a simple application of radio tracking. And it deals with invasive species. Now, invasive species, I talked about environmental change, and I talked about human-induced environmental change. We naturally think about, well, my example was for, um, logging before, but we think of climate change. But introducing novel species into an environment, what we do, we change that environment. And we don't know what the consequences are. Look at this picture in the background here. This is a, a river in North Queensland again. And this is a plant called rubber vine, which was introduced in the 1800s as an ornamental plant because it has pretty flowers. It got out of hand, and a lot of the rivers and creeks up there look like this. They're totally choked by rubber vine. Now, if you think that the effect of that is not only negative on wildlife because ecologically speaking, that environment is dead, but think of it, a lot of the farms where the cattle has to come down to the river, it blocks any sort of access of stock to the river. So the point I'm making is we introduce species, novel species into an environment, the effect as an ornamental plant, but the effect of those species is unpredictable. In this case, it's disastrous because it essentially makes whole stretches of, of, of riverbank unusable, both for stock and for wildlife. So invasive species, represent an environmental modification. And the effect of those is very hard to predict. It's a global problem. You probably just think of your way wherever you come. Um, if you're not from Australia, Europe and US and Asia all have their problems with, with introduced species. And often the effect is very detrimental, particularly waterborne water um, plants, but also animals. And, of course, it's a threat to the native environment. I mean, there's numerous species. It can start with um, bacteria introduced. You can look at marine species that denude whole natural, um, um, <coughs> naturally occurring resources in, in marine ecosystems. The list goes on and on and on. Australia has thousands of introduced species. How to manage these? What do we need to know? Because it upsets the ecological balance and that's not only important to maintain the natural environment, it is a real economic cost. So as humans, we need to manage that process or ameliorate the damage that's done. One particular animal that's very, um, that I think, I'm afraid, it has become quintessentially Australian, is the cane toad. Now cane toads 
originate from South America, South and Central America, and they're introduced to Australia in the 1930s, so they're not only introduced to Australia, but around the world as a control for a sugar beetle, a beetle that ate sugar cane. Now, the observation was that cane toads in their natural habitat ate that beetle. Now, what do you think happens? In this natural habitat, with all those interactions in place, the toad occurs with all the environmental impact which is specific to the toad and all the ecological interactions. If you take that toad out and put it somewhere else, what do you reckon happens? Exactly. It does something completely different. It never ate the beetle, it, but it ate everything else. So that's a great example. If, if you do things without realising those interactions, the effects are unpredictable. So let me tell you a bit about cane toads in Australia. Now, this is a picture of Kakadu National Park. I'll show you a, a map in a moment. That's the north of Australia. And um, what happens is this is the origin of the cane toad in, in South Central America. And the cane toad was introduced in 1935 up here in North Queensland. Now, just to orientate yourself, this is Sydney down here. Um, it's Brisbane here. It's about a thousand kilometres between the two kilometres between the two. So it's a fair way up north, and the equator is probably up here. So cane toads were introduced here in a big sugar, sugar cane um, growing area. Um, now cane toads actually didn't come directly from South America. They were first introduced in a lot of the Pacific Islands, and I think the cane toads that were introduced to Australia came from Hawaii. Anyway, so 1935, this is the range of cane toads as of 1996, where that, um, or 1995, where, where that diagram was taken. These little bits of toads are actually never established. But what happened just this year? Toads moved through here and are now going to Kakadu. Now, I don't know how much you know about Australia, but Kakadu is one of those holy grails in Australia. It's a huge and fairly much pristine wetland. And everyone was always very paranoid, what's going to happen if cane toads move in? One thing about cane toads is they're very toxic. They have eggs and larvae that are extremely toxic when eaten, not only to most other animals, if not all. And the toad itself, as you can see up here, it has these big venom glands at the back of the head. So if native animals eat it, they'll die. And that's the real fear of cane toads that'll simply um, eliminate a lot of the native species. And especially in places like this. Now, Australia is a pretty arid place. This may be the tropics, but it's really dry most of the time, except in the wet season. Now, cane toads made it through this sort of arid region and now find this cane toad heaven in, in Kakadu National Park, which is just this huge wetland, which dries up as well, but there'll always be standing water. So that's just an, just an example or sort of a broad picture of how toads fit in. Now, how could you control cane toads? Now, what you would need to know, first of all, is what do they do? What do they do all day? When do they move? What sort of habitats do they like? Um, how far do they move? What sort of environmental conditions do they need to disperse, to move? So it's very basic questions that need to be known before any sort of control measure can be um, introduced. And that's a little study I was involved in some years ago to simply use telemetry and find out the everyday life of a toad, particularly if they move directionally, if they move randomly, what sort of habitats they used. So how far do they use per unit time? Um, where do they shelter? Can, can you sort of predict where toads will actually end up settling on, um, on the grounds of the natural environment? So what I did, um, you use little transmitters and you put them with a waist strap around the waist of the toads. And this is uh, just again my 20 cent piece here and that's the transmitter you use. It's very small. Um, by, by and large, the size of um, transmitters really depends on the battery that's inside. So a transmitter like that that's very small probably only has a lifespan of maybe two or three months. But the larger the battery, the longer the, um, the transmitter will work and the longer periods you can monitor the animals. And you have a very long antenna that extends the range of the signal quite considerably. 
Now, the study was done on a place called Orpheus Island. At the time I was working, Sydney's down here, that's where we're now. At the time I was working at James Cook University in Townsville in North Queensland. And there's a little island here called Orpheus Island, which is a, um, which is a national park. And it's um, just about 10 kilometres or so off the shore of North Queensland. It's all national park, except there's a research station here by James Cook University and a very exclusive resort down the track here. And the study's taken place on the other side of the island here. It's uninhabited otherwise. There's no roads or anything like that. Um, I scanned these pictures in. They're not great. But you get the idea. You get a bit of rocky shore here, but then you get very pleasant beaches as well. And um, this is actually looking out... My campsite was right here, so it was right on the beach. And it's looking across a place called Phantom Island and the Palm Islands down here. Now, the Palm Islands are an interesting case because in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, a lot of the indigenous people from the interior of Australia were basically herded in and put onto Palm Island, or forcibly relocated, I suppose. And it's now one of the, um, one of the more troubled spots in Australia, but it's another great example of a disturbance that the um, really the impact of which is hard to predict and next to Palma and this is an island called Phantom Island which is uninhabited but until the 1970s mid 70s I think there was a leper colony on Phantom Island um, and the leper colony had some pins on Orpheus Island here it's, it's off limits you're not allowed to go but um, I snuck over there one day just to have a quick look and it's, it's quite it's quite um, quite eerie. You still see those big graveyards and all the buildings that are there and only abandoned about 30 years ago. So it's, a, it's an interesting area in, in Australia. And what I'll do, I'll get these little dinghies and I'll, I'll drive around from the research station. It'll be about an hour's, hour's drive or I get dropped off by a bigger boat. I'll take all my water and my food with me and get picked up a week later and to study these cane toads, just to track cane toads. And I did that for about 18 months. Every month I spent a week on Orpheus Island, which sounds pretty idyllic. But, I mean, I'll tell you the truth, I got pretty sick of it. Because if you spend a week in summer on a tropical island like that, you have marsh flies, you have mosquitoes, you have sand flies. You don't have showers, you've got sand everywhere. You get pretty jack of it. But it was still good. <laughs> it's, so if you go inland from the beach, what you find is it's fairly dry bush, fairly dense. But um, there's no standing water except after the wet season you have these have big puddles forming in here and that's where the toads breed. There's lots of frogs and lots of other wildlife on there as well. And the, island, and the idea was the study um, really looked at the small scale movement of those toads. What sort of shelters do they use? And what times of year do they move? Monitor the environment and relate environmental variables to their behaviour. A fairly simple sort of ecological study. I apologise for the photo of myself. It's the only one I had someone radio tracking. But that's what you look like when you radio track. And what you have is an antenna, a handheld antenna in the hand here, and a receiver and, a, and an earphone here. And the transmitters on the toad, and what you do, for example, you track the toad and, and find its location um, every day or twice a day over a period of months. So you get an idea of long term movements. So you just walk around and find the animal and get a GPS reading on it, and that's the simplest application. Um, I did my honours degree in, in Sydney Uni here, and I did radio tracking of echidnas. I don't know if you know what echidnas are. They're, those little things look like hedgehogs, but they're not hedgehogs. I have lots of spines. But I did that in a national park just in the north of Sydney. And you sort of attract a lot of attention when you sort of walk around with your antenna and people always think you're either looking for lost jewellery or whatever. So anyway, you look like a bit of a fool, but it's very, very effective to track these animals. So what sort of data do we get? You look at movement, and one, one obvious thing is amphibians and toads in particular lose water very quickly. Now their skin acts as an open water surface. That means it's the same as having a bowl of water out. A toad will lose water at the same rate. There's absolutely no resistance to water loss. So toads in particular are very much um, threatened by desiccation. Some frog species have, have evolved sort of waxy layers that actually reduce the water loss, not so toads. 
So one obvious thing to do is have a look at soil moisture, because the animals, of course, sit on, they don't climb trees, they're always on the ground, and plot that over distance moved overnight. A very simple parameter, very useful, though, to predict when and where toads are going to move and disperse. And you see there is a very good relationship. It, of course, there's an asymptote here because there's a maximum distance a toad can move overnight, but when it's very dry, they stay put. A really interesting question is, is the movement of a toad, do they know where they go, or do they just stay put? And then there's a lot of literature from the 70s and 80s that sort of said that toads actually had a home site and they moved around and then came back to the same spot all the time. So they showed this homing behavior. So one thing I was interested in is, well, is it random or do they know where they go? And um, of course that makes a difference. If it's random, it's unpredictable. It makes it harder to manage. If they know where to go, if they always come back to the same place, it potentially makes it easier to manage the toads in terms of eradicating them. So if you look here, the red line is the actual observed movement just on a, on a um, coordinate system here. It's just distance moved in two directions. So this is the movement that's actually measured. That's just one example. And what you can do, you can generate a random walk model that simply um, generates random distances and random angles the toads move. And by and large, really, what you find out, the toads move totally randomly. They absolutely have no design. They just move around. There is no difference between a random walk model, which is a randomly generated toad-like walk, and the walk of a real toad. So, um, and I even went so far as to calculate how often they ended up at the same place where they started randomly and was at the same frequency. So you learn something from this very simple tracking. You learn something about the animal, what they do, and um, how they utilize the environment. In the case of the toad here, at least in terms of hopping, it's random. But it's not random in terms of if you looked at it over a larger time scale over a year. This is simply the proportion of nights toads come out and move. They come out in the open from their shelter and move over um, months, like January to December. And what I've plotted is simply soil moisture of a movement. And you see there is a, there's a very clear pattern, a very seasonal pattern of movement. So again, if you wanted to think about any sort of control measure, you probably, if you wanted to get toads in the hop, so to speak, you wouldn't come out in, in October or November. You'll do it in, in April or May when there is most, most activity. So that's just a, my, my simplest example of how you can use radio telemetry to learn something about animals. Now, the next thing, what I'm, what I'm really more interested in, or my particular liking, is to look at the capacity. What capacity have animals got to respond to changes in the environment? So it's the physiology and the biochemistry. Now, a lot of that work, of course, is, um, is laboratory work, but you need to find out nonetheless what do animals do in their natural environment? What are they exposed to, or what do they expose themselves to in the natural environment, and how does their physiology respond to, for example, temperature, to diving, to, um, to a number of environmental parameters? Now, my sec second example then looks at physiology. What are animals capable of? What's, what, what are they not capable of? What's the framework within which they can operate? So, for example, biochemistry, metabolism. Everything, metabolism is ubiquitous and, and it's one of the most important functions is how to get energy and essential products in your body from food. So metabolism. Um, cardiovascular function. We all know how important the cardiovascular system is. Your cardiovascular system supplies oxygen to all your cells, it supplies nutrients, it takes away waste. And heart rate in particular in vertebrates determines how much blood is pumped out and how active your cardiovascular system is in response to in the environment and your behavior. Muscle function is, of course, just a protein function, two proteins sliding along each other. And all proteins are, for example, temperature dependent. So the physiological response to the environment then underlies the potential behavior and, and ecology because animals simply if they're not capable of doing something, um, it can't be part of the ecology either. So to find out the capacity 
a physiological capacity um, in, in terms of in using telemetry. This is one example. Now, I, I measured temperature telemetry before, and most of the time, like a transmitter will give you a regular beep, a tracking transmitter. In a, in a temperature transmitter, there's a thermistor, what's called a thermistor inside the transmitter, that modulates the signal depending on the temperature the transmitter is at. So what you get, this is a typical example of a, um, a 20 cent coin, and this is a um, temperature transmitter. This time it hasn't got an external antenna because it's designed to be implanted into the body cavity of the animals. So the antenna is on the inside of this um, epoxy coating. And if you had a look at the interval between two signals, the interval between two beeps, um, and plot this the interval of a temperature, you see they beep slower the colder they are. And that's predictable and repeatable. So you can measure the interval between two beeps from your transmitter and, um, and then determine the temperature within 0.1 of a degree. So it's a very accurate way to measure temperature, and in this case, in my example here, the internal temperature of organisms. The second physiological application of, um, of telemetry is measuring heart rate. There's recently it's just been a development to measure um, blood flow, in particular blood vessels as well, by telemetry, which is not commercially available and very complicated. But heart rate telemetry is tricky, but it's possible. So, and I said before, you have a heart, it contracts. That muscle contraction is a re result of nerve depolarization, which, which generates a voltage. And that voltage is picked up by the transmitter. So the transmitter looks like this. This is coated again in, in, a, um, in a waterproof coating, but it has two electrodes um, attached to it. So you essentially have a voltage meter, which is your transmitter, and that and, and two electrodes that, that trigger the transmitter and then a big antenna and, and the transmitting part of course sends that signal to, um, to your receiver. So for example, if you have a lizard like this, this is a bearded dragon, which is one of the most um, charismatic lizards. I think they're very popular in the pet trade in the US and Europe in particular. But they have a heart that beats. So, and what you can do is then put a transmitter, put two electrodes. Oops, something got very loud. You put two electrodes on either side of the heart and put the transmitter on the back. And what happens, there's a, a voltage generated by each heartbeat, which is in a species like this, probably between 50 and 200 microvolts. And the transmitters are sensitive enough to pick that up. And so each time the heart beats, the transmitter will fire. So you're standing remotely a kilometer away and you hear your transmitter fire and each signal corresponds to a heartbeat in this animal. So that's, um, the electrodes are tunneled under the skin. They don't sit on the surface. So you make an incision here and tunnel them underneath the skin. Um, so everything's well sealed, but the, the transmitter is usually external. Okay, now, the model organism for these studies on physiology are crocodiles. Now, crocodiles are great model organisms because for a number of reasons, there's the importance of crocodiles in conservation. They're a top predator in lots of ecological systems. So that makes them ecologically important. They're commercially valuable because their skins and meat fetch a very high price. And I think that's sort of led Harry Messel to the first conservation movement on crocodiles because they're almost hunted to extinction. Um, and the third thing, they're large enough and you can put lots of hardware into them, which makes them very good. Let me say a few, a few words about crocodiles. Now, crocodiles are archosaurs. Uh, archosaurs are a group of animals that includes dinosaurs, birds, and crocodiles. There's 23 species worldwide, and because, mainly because um, of their commercial value, but also because they're potentially harmful to humans, most of them are threatened or endangered. Actually, some species really making a good comeback, um, thanks to, to international efforts by the IUCN. Now, most crocodiles are tropical. There's a couple of temperate species of alligator, the Chinese alligator and American alligators. And in Australia, we have two species. Um, one is endemic, that is, it only occurs in Australia, and the other one occurs throughout the Indo-Pacific. 
Now, just let me say a few words about archosaurs, which is quite interesting, and that, again, makes crocodiles scientifically interesting. Have a look at... Um, so that's archosauria, if you like. Have a look at the time scale here, Triassic, about 220 million years ago, Jurassic, uh, just about 150 million years ago, 65 million years ago, the age of dinosaurs up here. And what you have, there's a common ancestor somewhere in here of birds, crocodiles, dinosaurs and pterosaurs. So in that sense, there's one line that goes towards the crocodilians and another lineage that goes towards pterosaurs, dinosaurs and birds. Um, now this, the ancestor may have looked like this, maybe, maybe not, but it's a good picture. Um, and there's a whole lot of evolution of crocodilians along that lineage here. So what we see is really uh, the remnant. And this is an example. This is actually a very large saltwater crocodile head of an animal that's about four and a half meters long. So you can definitely see that you wouldn't want to go swimming where this guy occurred who was found in Central Africa just a couple of years ago. And Sacrosuchus, I think he grew to about uh, 12 or 13 meters in length. So it's a pretty fascinating sort of fossil history you find in crocodiles. On the other side, you of course have dinosaurs. The most famous one is T-Rex, but a huge radiation of dinosaurs. And the last of the living dinosaurs are of course birds. So, <laughs> so really, birds are by definition, if you want to look at taxonomy, birds are dinosaurs. And the closest living relatives to birds are crocodiles. And crocodiles are only distantly related to lizards and snakes and other things like that. So people using the word reptile, reptile includes then all lizards, snakes, crocodiles and birds. But crocodiles and birds belong to a much, much tighter group called the arch archosaurs. Now the two species that occur in Australia are Crocodilus porosus or the saltwater crocodile, which is the largest living crocodile, I think the largest ever um, substantiated record was seven meters, for, but I mean usually they're much smaller, or at least they're smaller these days because all the large ones were shot out in the 1960s. Um, this is the distribution or the original distribution of these animals, northern Australia, throughout the Indo-Pacific and into Asia here. I think the populations are going quite well in Australia again now, but um, the status of the animals is, is quite... Um, varied over its range. The second animal is Crocodilus johnsoni, which is a freshwater crocodile. It grows to about three metres. Again, lots of them are, are smaller. It's very common. It's one of only two or three species in the world that's not dangered or, or, or threatened. So there's plenty of freshies, as they're known, and they only occur in the north of Australia. They do occur in salt water as well, but they usually occur in sort of inland billabongs. The thing about crocodiles is like birds, they have salt glands. They have glands on their tongue that allows them to go in salt water and they excrete almost crystals of salt just to, to maintain their body and in a constant concentration they can excrete salt similar to a lot of shorebirds do that. So that allows them to live in salt water for as long as they like. Okay, now this study um, again this time we're up here. This is Cape, Cape York Peninsula, which is a pretty fascinating area in Australia. It's one of the last frontiers, as people say. Lots of tourists drive up there nowadays. But what you find in Australia, you have along the east coast, you have the Great Dividing Range, which is very close to the coast. And that means all the rivers running east are very short. You don't have the very fast flowing and short rivers. So it's not very good habitat for crocodiles, although. Historically, crocodiles extended down to south of Rockhampton here, um, but these days you're probably hard pressed to find any, any in this area. And most of the crocodiles are up here near Darwin, Northern Territory, and this is Kakadu National Park up here. But Lakefield National Park, which is this area up here, the difference is that the mountain range actually goes further inland. So in this area, you get some fairly long rivers that drain into. Princess Charlotte Bay. So what happens? Because they're slow flowing of a, of a winter, which is the dry season, it's a monsoonal climate, so you have a summer a wet season and winter dry season. Rather than the water all flowing in the oceans and the, and the rivers drying up, you have a lot of water holes and billabongs 
that remain. And then some of them are kilometers long and, and up to 20, 30 meters deep. So you essentially have permanent water in here, which is quite unusual for the East Coast. Now, and it looks a bit like this. So some of the water holes are overgrown by, by, um, by various water plants. Um, but by and large, the Australian tropics are not what you imagine the tropics to look like. They're dry tropics, by and large. So it's a fairly arid. And this is a typical picture of a um, dried up creek bed. So most of the areas look like this. So you don't have lush um, tropical rainforests. You do in places. But by and large, it's a fairly arid environment. But then you have these water holes, these, um, these deeper holes in creeks that, that remain over the dry season. And that's where all the crocodiles congregate. And the way to catch freshwater crocodiles is to set nets, which you can see one here. And, um, and then you take a boat and you simply check the nets. Now, because there are saltwater crocodiles around, you don't go in the water. If there weren't any, you could go in the water and just prod the animals and chase them into the nets. It's quite a lot of fun, really. But in this case, we, we just did it out of a boat. And then you picked up, pick up the animals. And that's a, that's a nice adult freshwater crocodile that we put a lot of hardware onto it. Um, so what, what happens then, this is a fairly remote place. Often we just camp out in the bush. Sometimes we stay in, in, in stations, cattle stations or, or ranger stations. We we'll set up a surgery in the bush because what we need to do is implant, surgically implant a temperature transmitter in the inside of the animal. And the other thing is to, to put a heart rate transmitter on the outside of the animal to measure the heart rate. Now, that sounds really easy, but it's actually really tricky because the physics are easy. You have something that generates a voltage every now and then, you just have to measure it. But because one crocodile body is never like the next, the way the, um, the electrical signal spreads out through the body cavity varies between animals. And to pick up um, a point where you can actually, or to pick a point for your electrodes where you can pick up the signal is actually quite tricky particularly because the voltages are so small. You 50, 60 microvolts volt, is um, the lowest you can pick up. So what we've got here is like, it's called a power lab, which is like a computerized oscilloscope, if you like, a computerized recording system and a little amplifier to amplify the voltages so we can measure them, connected to a laptop computer. And we're just measuring um, ECGs of, of animals to find good spots to put our electrodes. And then what's going to happen is we run uh, the electrode wires under the skin from back here to wherever we find a good spot on either side of the heart and suture them in place and seal, seal the holes with super glue and then tape the transmitter over the tail. Now, once we've done that, you have to implant the, the, um, the, the temperature measuring transmitter into the body cavity, and that's done surgically. You just cut in the side of the animal, actually. Because the other curious thing about crocodiles is they have ribs on their stomach, belly ribs as they're called, and it's their thought to strengthen the, the ventral surface because the animals rub on the ground, move on the ground a lot. So you can't cut in there because you'd have to cut through the ribs, which are cartilage. So we'll go in the side, and just that's the peritoneal lining you can see there. You cut through there, pop the transmitter in, and stitch them back up. Now, You've seen that photo I showed you before with me holding the antenna, and, and, and that's of course very tedious because you have to be there all the time and record your signals, especially when you want to record heart rates or temperature, because what you need to do, you've got to measure the interval between two beeps to get your temperature. And it's a very tedious thing if you want a temperature every five minutes, because you're there for hours and hours and hours with your stopwatch or whatever. So what we devised is this system of automatic recording. Again, we use, we use this power lab here, which is the um, computerized recording system hooked up to a laptop computer. And we have these are telemetry receivers that receive the signal, and they're connected to this power lab. Um, everything is, these are connected to a 12 volt truck battery, which runs on 12 volt DC. But then there's an inverter in between that, that converts the DC voltage to an AC voltage to run these units here. In theory, in the lab, when I set it up, it worked beautifully. In the field, it was a nightmare because nothing worked. There was interference, and it was... We got it to work in the end, and it was actually really good because what you ended up with, the truck battery, battery ended up running this whole system for 12 hours. 
So we had to swap them over every 12 hours. But you get a computer file in the end that contains all your signals. And, and you had, essentially, you had a heartbeat um, with each telemetry signal, and it was recorded on a chart, if you like, an electronic chart. So you could just download it on, or it was downloaded on your computer, and, um, and it was actually a very neat way to monitor the animals and the physiology of the animals. Okay, there's our crocodile, or so one of them. So what we did, we put one of those time depth recorders. Remember I showed you that picture of that little computer that measured the pressure? We put it on the back. That's just a neoprene jacket that is more or less if the, if the time depth recorder falls off, we can find it again because they're very expensive. They're about two or $3,000 each. And, and if we don't find it again, we can't download the data. Remember, it was a, what's called an archival um, telemetry. So it stored all its own data. And that's why we put a tracking transmitter onto the time depth recorder so we can, if it fell off, we could find it wherever it was. Then we put a um, temperature transmitter into the internal body cavity of the animal so we can get internal temperature. And then we put a heart rate transmitter on the back of the animal. Now you get the idea that crocodiles are great. Anything smaller couldn't handle all the hardware. But crocodiles are great because the total percentage of body weight of all these things would be way less than 5%. They're all very small. So relative to the animal size, it, it really is, is negligible. What do we find? What sort of data do we get? Just a simple readout from one of these time depth recorders. This is diving depth. That's the surface. Time of day. This is just one example. Um, so you can see activity patterns of the animals. You know, some animals actually dive for two or three hours at a time, totally voluntary. They just sit on the ground and you can see at what time of day they become active, probably early morning. They're not very active at night. And that's quite contrary to what people believe. People always believe that crocodiles were active. They warm up in the morning and then they become active in the afternoon and evening. Not so. So if, if you have a look at this, it relates activity to body temperature. Now the blue is activity. The red line is temperature. What's really interesting here, it's descriptive, but it's, remember, it's learning about what the animals do in their natural environment. And you can see they become active when they're really cold. Early morning, they're really active, and then the acti activity decreases and the animals warm up. And when you think back to what I said before about the effect of temperature on organisms, you expect the other way around. You'd expect for all the muscle functions to happen, for the animals to swim around, to chase prey, to feed, they ought to be warm, because that's what the textbooks tell us, but they're not. And that just simply hints at a much broader physiological capacity than we ever thought these animals had. And it's a great result from telemetry, because it tells you something about the animals you could otherwise not learn. So you have this kind of two phases, one of activity and then of one, one of warming up. This is temperature, by the way, here, 22 to 30. So water temperature is 21 degrees. Okay, what happens if we now, now into all these data of diving and temperature, let's put the heart rate in there as well. It makes quite a complicated graph, but again, it's great information. Okay, bear with me. On this axis, you see temperature and heart rate. It's either degrees centigrade or beats per minute. And this is diving depth on, on the second y axis here. Look at the red line, oh, look at the um, black line first, which is the diving behavior. You can see the animals are underwater. They come out, they're on the surface, then they dive again, and then they come to the surface again. What happens is, at this point, the animal comes out basking along the sun and warms up. Then it dives again and probably stays at the water surface, so temperature decreases. They keep heating, of course, after they dive because the large body will take some time to cool. So the core of the animal, where the transmitter sits, will keep on heating before that heat exchange happens between the surface and the interior, so the conduction process takes longer. Now what's really interesting, now look at the blue line, which is heart rate. What happens, the animal comes out and basking warms up and heart rate shoots up. And then as soon as the animal goes in the water and the surface of the animal becomes cold, heart rate plummets way down instantaneously. Now this is akin, this is a behavior that's akin to um, us getting cold hands, for example. If you're out, it's a cold day. The first thing you feel, your hands are getting cold or your feet are getting cold. 
And what your body does, it reduces circulation to the periphery to, to reduce heat loss. Your hands and feet are great heat exchangers. And by simply decreasing blood flow to the periphery, your body conserves the heat inside. And that's exactly what these animals do. It's a similar response. And when they come out to bask, their surface is warm, the animals cool, their surface is warm, and um, they increase their, their heart rate, thereby they increase how much blood is pumped into the body and is pumped to the surface to pick up heat, and they heat up quicker. As soon as they go back into the water here, they simply decrease heart rate really quickly to conserve the heat inside. And that's what our bodies do when we get cold hands, we conserve the heat inside. So. It's a very interesting interaction here between the phys physiological parameters and the behavior of the animal. Okay, that leads me to my last example, example number three. And um, it deals with satellite tracking. Now we come back to tracking, and I, I remember the, 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 um, the picture with the handheld antenna. Now there's more sophisticated ways to do this, and particular animals that move long distances. And that's as the name suggests by satellite. So it's long distance movement, usually by larger animals, because small animals don't move that far. And it's been successfully used in marine turtles. On migrating birds, you can see a transmitter attached to the neck here. And also on crocodiles, and that's what I'll talk about, satellite tracking of crocodiles. The way it works, first of all, you have a crocodile and it has a transmitter on the back here. It's actually stitched to the, to the uh, scoots and then, then glued over with epoxy. And this is an antenna. And that antenna will send a signal to a, to a satellite circulating the Earth. And what you do, you buy time, satellite time, and whenever the satellite comes over, crosses where your transmitter is, it'll record the location of the transmitter to within, if I get it right, to within about 10 meters. So what you get, whenever the satellite passes, and it depends how much money you pay, how many passes you get, what satellites you get on, you get these large-scale movements of, of your animal um, that you could not, could not follow by hand or, or by boat or whatever. So it's a great way to get large-scale large, um, large movement. And the way it works, you have, just to summarize that again, this is the, this is, this is the Earth. And you have a satellite here. The satellite will cross over in certain parts of the world as, as, it, as it moves around the globe. And if it picks up your transmitter somewhere, it'll send that signal, the, um, the coordinates where the transmitter was, to a, to a base station on Earth. And that base station will simply then, via telephone lines, download those data on your computer in your office. So you have to do nothing. Where you have to catch the animal, put the transmitter on, and then simply sit down in front of your computer and receive all the data. Um, it's, it's a great way of tracking animals. So that signal simply is there in here, wherever the trans that satellite can see it. Now, I should say that I'm, I'm only very marginally involved in this research. This is mainly run by a good friend of mine, Mark Reed, from the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, who is responsible, by and large, for crocodile management in North Queensland. And there's another character who you may know or may not know, or may want to know or not know, which is um, the intrepid Australian crocodile hunter Steve Irvin, who actually funds quite a lot of this research. Now, one thing, whether, whether or not you like Steve's shows on television, he actually puts his money where his mouth is, and he actually funds a lot of this wildlife, like, wildlife research. And Mark and, Mark and Steve has worked, have worked together a fair bit. And this is a crocodile just caught. This is a four and a half metre male. It's at Lakefield National Park. Now, I just want to show you a couple of um, those tracking records. This is again on Cape York Peninsula. Remember that, that um, little triangle sticking up in the north of Australia. And this is the Nesbitt River, which is fairly much close to the top on the east coast. Um, and these are simple the, the satellite fixes of a whole year, or nearly a year, starting um, yeah, in January through to December. These are not ordered. And there's two things which are really interesting out of here. First of all, the animal that's caught, you know, it hangs around an area by and large, but it can travel a fair way upstream. And they're called saltwater crocodiles, but they're known to travel way into fresh water. And in fact, 
they can only successfully build nests and reproduce in fresh water. So they're always tied to fresh water. The other thing is uh, they can move out to sea a fair distance. So this animal, for example, moved out to sea a kilometre or two here, and on the same day, or same month, you find it quite a way up in the fresh water. So they're very highly mobile animals. And that's really important for management. I'll show you another one here. This is, this is a two, two and a half metre male called Banana. I didn't name it. It was captured up here and relocated 60 kilometres further south. It was released here. Now the interesting thing is this, the green September, this happened in September. So look at the green triangles. In the same month, it moved back about 30 kilometres. And then in, in October, which are the blue ones, it moved back to where it was captured. But then subsequently, it simply moved back down and back up. Way back down where it was released, and then way back up here, for example, in October. Now, one of the strategies that a lot of the, the city councils use up in North Queensland, like Cairns City Council, and is removal of crocodiles. There's lots of crocodiles that come into the harbour at Cairns, and people get worried about them. So what they do, they simply catch them, relocate them 50 kilometres further on, and then think the problem's solved. But, I mean, these data, of course, tell you the problem's not solved at all, and it's a stupid thing to do, and it's a waste of money. But that's why, again, just stressing that point I made, to understand what animals do, that then, first of all, we have to understand what they do in their natural situation, and then we can manage it. But to do it without knowing what they do is a waste of money and totally pointless. Okay, just as a summary, so tracking. What do animals do? Telemetry. You can learn what they do, you can learn their capacity, and you can um, then use that information for management. I think the last example was probably the best because of the, um, the relocation of crocodiles. It's so obviously stupid that, um, that you know, it sort of makes the point. You have to learn about the animals before, before we can manage our environment. And that, of course, then leads into planning, planning the effect of, of our impact on, on natural environments and also remediation. If you can learn what animals really need in the environment, we can improve already damaged environments to make that um, habitable again for um, species that may have disappeared. Okay, I'll leave it at that.